So the MSPCA Angel is endeavoring to do something very unique in the world of veterinary medicine. We are set to launch a life-saving program to provide blood to pets in need. We tend to take for granted in human medicine the challenges of keeping a fresh and plentiful supply of blood available at all times. But I can tell you that as an alum of the American Red Cross, I know it's something we don't even like to think about until there's a shortage. As with human hospitals, veterinary centers treat patients every single day who need transfusions of blood and blood products. How do we get the blood? How do we know that it's indeed safe? What do we do when there's a shortage? We are privileged that Dr. Megan Whalen is leading the creation of the MSPCA Angel Blood Bank. And she's here to answer these questions and more for us. So with that, Dr. Whalen, welcome to the MSPCA Angel Giving Day. It's all yours. Thanks so much, Neil. So hopefully tonight will be educational. I just wanted to um, talk about Seeing Red, the plans for Angel Animal Medical Center's life-saving blood bank. Um, so here's a little Yorkie, uh, Karen Perry of mine, receiving blood. So these are the topics that we're going to cover. We're gonna talk a little bit about Angel Animal Medical Center. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, we will talk about blood and blood products. So where do veterinarians get blood for our patients? And why would we consider building our own blood bank? And why we need your support? So Angel Animal Medical Center is one of the largest tertiary referral centers in the country. We are a nonprofit hospital that's animal centered. So we are fair free and we humanely source our products and have our resources because we're closely linked with the MSPCA. This past year, we completed our new ICU, which is fabulous, up to date, spacious, great for our patients. And we are going to give a facelift to our old ICU, which should be finished in the next few months. So our whole facility for our patients will be brand new for all inpatients that are staying at the hospital. Due to our staff and equipment, we are able to provide top-notch cutting edge medicine. And this cannot occur without a way for us to obtain blood products in a timely manner. So the last part is the key. Uh, when we need it, we can't wait. A little bit about myself. So uh, I am a critical care doctor. This is a radiograph of a dog that has uh, a pacemaker implant. This is my dog, Chewy. Unfortunately, he got a corneal ulcer from a scratch playing with his friend. So he's being treated here at home. I do like sloths. This is molasses, um, the sloth at Franklin Park Zoo. Everybody who knows me uh, knows that I like SpongeBob. He's a happy-go-lucky uh, character. This is a picture of my son, Bryson. Um, and Ooh. I often like to spend time at the beach. So this is kind of my background when I am not working at Angel. So blood price, let's talk about the reality and then what our plan is. So the reality is we depend on national blood banks to be able to do our job. Uh, we use blood all the time and we can't always get it. And so we have to order it from the blood banks. Uh, the problem is, is there is a national shortage of animal blood products. So I may want to order um, a unit of blood, but I can't get it uh, for another week. So we often go weeks without any availability which is uh, impossible when we're treating six patients. So we have to augment uh, this blood um, bank with our own collection on site. So we do this routinely, um, but not to a large scale. So currently, I think we only have seven dog donors and one cat donor. And we get these donors from our employee um, pets. So our own pets, those that work at the hospital, uh, we enroll our own pets to help the hospitalized patients. 
The closest uh, blood banking veterinary program that really is stellar is Cornell University. They have a big program and um, do it well. So we have visited them and seen how they um, run their blood banking program. So our goal or our plan is to build our own blood bank. And so we have two criticalists, Dr. Coyd and Dr. Bracker at the forefront. Dr. Patty Ewing is our head of uh, clinical pathology. She's a double boarded pathologist and Nicole Paquette, who is the manager of the lab. So if we also had our own blood bank, we would be assured that the blood that we obtained is humanely sourced so that these animals are well taken care of, that they're up to date, they don't have infectious disease, so we're not transmitting disease to other patients inadvertently. Um, and we know when to bleed them appropriately so that we're not taking blood from them too frequently. So I don't know how the national blood banks keep track of everything, but if we did it in house, we would for sure be able to monitor and make sure everything was up to par and appropriate. So what is our current supply? And then we'll talk about what is the real demand in the hospital. So there are four main blood banks that we source from. I imagine there are some smaller ones as well, but Nine Lives Blood Services is where we get all our um, cat blood. So type A feline blood is the most common and it can take up to three to, month, three to nine months to get a unit of packed red blood cells for a cat. Hema Solutions, IndyVet and Animal Blood Resources are all um, areas that we get dog blood from. So the wait list for canine negative blood can be four to nine months. For positive blood, it's 10 days. The reason for the difference is negative blood in dog is the universal donor. That means that you're able to give that blood to any patient that has not received a transfusion before. And so that's why it's more coveted or hard to obtain. FFP is something called fresh frozen plasma. So in your blood, you have plasma as well. And sometimes you don't want the red blood cells, you just want the plasma. And so you can order that specifically. The issue is, is that they ship it frozen. And so the packets are cold and brittle. And even though they're wrapped in bubble wrap, they can often um, have a small break in it. So when you thaw it out to hang the plasma for the pet, it can leak. Those can take up to two weeks to get fresh frozen plasma. So that's our supply issue. And then let's talk about the demand or what we need in the hospital on a daily basis. So the use of fresh frozen plasma really goes in waves. Sometimes we use a couple units. And if we have a patient that's on total plasma exchange where we take all the plasma from the pet and remove it from the blood and replace it with new plasma, you can imagine we could go through multiple units and use all our plasma that we have stored for the week on one patient in a couple treatments of total plasma exchange. So blood, um, typically we have two to four patients that need blood per week. Um, however, one individual patient may need multiple units. And so it's easy to drain the blood bank if you have a couple critical patients that say need surgery or had a traumatic event. Um, you know, one patient could use it all in one day. And then what about the next patient that comes in? What, what do we do in those situations? So I just um, took some pictures how we actually receive the blood and what it looks like. So when it's shipped from um, these other areas, those four other blood banks, it usually comes and looks like this. They're individually packaged, usually in this bubble wrapped. And you can see here are two units of packed red blood cells um, for dogs. So what would be involved if we were to do our own blood bank? Cause see, you can see here, this is our little cat blood bank. We have two little units and some thawed plasma. So this is pretty minuscule and not very impressive. Um, and so what we would want to do is have donor recruitment. And so we would pay for the heartworm flea tick preventatives for a year uh, to make sure that they're parasite free. We would test their blood. We would give them physical exams. And of course, if they ever needed blood in their future, we would give them um, free units to cover them because they were a donor. And what would that look like? So if they're not employee pets, we would have to recruit um, patients that are already part of our system that may see our general medicine service that are healthy, that we would do their screening. Uh, we would give them free blood. They get um, 
you know, some free food, snacks, and we make it a positive experience. And so the owners and the pets get something from this process. So we would have these recruitment appointments, introduce them to what does blood banking entail um, and the process so that we could build our own internal blood bank. So here's an example. These hopefully aren't too graphic, but essentially uh, a dog patient is sedated and the blood is taken right through here and it's captured in the container. The same for a cat, except on a smaller level, it's just drawn up in a syringe and then placed in um, the unit container for dispension. So what type of equipment would be needed? Uh, when you go to a higher scale, you, you need more space. And so we would need the renovation of the lab in a certain area so that we were able to store the actual large equipment and use the space appropriately. So this is a, um, one piece of the equipment that we have. It's a refrigerated centrifuge. You can see it takes up half of this, this room. Um, we also need a very large blood refrigerator that's um, at certain temperatures so that the blood and um, the products that we have in there don't go bad. And we also need a plasma freezer. So we need the frozen component of it, a plasma extractor, a line stripper. These are just some of the, the equipment that we need to be able to run a blood bank ourselves. So a little bit about transfusion history. Back in 1665, Dr. Lauer was the first one to perform a successful transfusion between dogs. So this has been happening for quite some time. Uh, and later on, um, they had transfusions called xenotransfusions between a human and a lamb species, so different species. So now that's outlawed because of adverse effects. Obviously, you don't want to be transfusing animal blood into people. Uh, 1795, the first human blood transfusion was performed. 1873, they used milk as a blood substitute, and then they realized, no, we should use saline 10 years later. In the 1900s, they figured out that there are actually different blood types that were discovered. And in the 1950s is really when veterinary medicine discovered the clinical usefulness of transfusion. It was recognized and then began to grow as we were able to treat sicker patients, we realized the necessity of being able to obtain blood. And now it's very commonplace at tertiary facilities. The smaller general practices typically do not have blood or blood donors um, just because of the amount that's involved. Uh, so they will refer to the bigger hospitals, um, say they could treat their patient, but they need a transfusion. They will transfer that pet to us to get that help. So why do we need your support? The answer is simple is we have really sick critical patients that we could save lives with the use of blood. So here's a picture of a dog that was hit by a car, two units of blood are running into this dog. This is a picture of a dog where you see all these little pink dots, it's called petechiation. So this you commonly see in a pet that has a low platelet count. So if you don't have enough platelets, you will bleed. And so these patients often um, need a blood transfusion. If not, uh, you can actually give a platelet concentrate transfusion. So it's a very small component of blood where you just give the platelets. So there's um, not just blood, you can give different components uh, when you get skilled at blood banking. And that's what we would like to do, have cryoprecipitate plasma, uh, platelet-rich plasma, besides just packed red blood cells. Currently, the blood that we obtain is called whole blood we don't do anything to it. So the whole blood has the packed red cells in it. It has the plasma, has all the factors. So it's um, not broken up into its components. So here's a picture of a dog that's quite pale and this dog would need blood. And this is a picture of a blood smear that shows why the dog would need blood. So a typical red blood cell is pictured here. This is a normal size. You see in the middle, the center of pallor, it's called. So it's like paler. This little um, arrow identifies a red blood cell called a spherocyte. So it's a very small uh, red blood cell where essentially the outside has been snipped off by the body because antibodies have attached to the surface. The body sees it as foreign, removes that little piece from the red cell membrane, and then you're left with a pretty non-functional red cell 
called a spherocyte. So when we see spherocytes on our blood smear with a pet that's anemic, we know that they have a process called uh, IMHA, so an autoimmune disease. The question is why? Is it uh, idiopathic? We don't know why. It's just inherent in that pet. Or was it triggered by something else? Cancer, the, um, that they received uh, a particular drug that triggered it in the body. Regardless of the cause, these pets also need blood and frequently multiple blood transfusions. So which diseases are transfusions used for? Quite frankly, a lot. I just listed a few of these here, but obviously if there was a traumatic event, hit by car, uh, acute blood loss, you would need it. Say you had cancer and a ruptured splenic mass and a hemoabdomen, you would need immediate blood. Say you had more chronic disease, like a older cat that has renal disease and they're not producing um, their own red cells. So they slowly become more and more anemic and they often will need a red blood, red blood cell transfusion just to, to treat them. Intervascular IMHA, we spoke about that. Uh, pancreatitis, sepsis, you need to go to surgery. So the worst thing that can happen is if you're in surgery, you lose a lot of blood on a patient but then you don't have blood to give that patient and that's really what they need to be able to survive the surgery. If you have a bone marrow issue where your bone marrow is knocked out either by drug or disease and you're not able to produce your own red blood cells, a transfusion can be helpful. Having GI hemorrhage, so you have bloody diarrhea, gastroenteritis, you can lose a lot of red cells and, and, and could necessitate if severe a blood transfusion. Uh, accidentally, a lot of pets do ingest uh, rodenticide and come in and the first signs are evidence of bleeding. And unless they get plasma to replace those uh, clotting factors in blood, they, they could pass away. Thrombocytopenia we talked about, that was that low platelet count, they often need blood. So there's a lot of different things that all disciplines in the hospital use. So it's not just in critical care internists, surgeons, we all reach for blood on particular cases. So let me just give you one cute case example. This is Molly. She's a 10 year old speed female Shih Tzu here. You can see her little face. She was treated last spring here for a severe intervascular IMHA. So she had that autoimmune disease. She received multiple units of DEA 1.1 positive blood. That was her blood type. So she needed so much blood because she was destroying her own. And then she received three rounds of total plasma exchange where we removed her plasma that had these antibodies that were attacking her own red cells and replaced it with new plasma. So she went through three separate treatments of this. Um, so that was a 14 day hospitalization and a large amount of blood products were used but she was saved and she's doing quite well now, um, a year since her hospitalization. So I just have some other pictures to show you kind of the cool machinery. This is um, our renal replacement machine that we can do total plasma exchange, uh, dialysis on, but we can often use a lot of blood products when these patients are attached. So this is just how uh, plasma is obtained from one of um, the big suppliers. So they come frozen. Uh, that's why they're wearing these, these gloves and they come in these packages and they're very brittle containers. So we laid them flat like this in the hopes that they are not damaged from transit when we thaw them out. So here's a dialysis machine with the blood and then the plasma that's attached that we're replacing the plasma that we removed from the pet that's essentially diseased or troubled. Here's another dog receiving um, blood total plasma exchange. So we're treating this dog to try to rid of the um, disease in the blood. This picture of another dog attached. So that's very high level use of blood products besides the very straightforward, I have some type of trauma and I need to give blood and replace what has been lost. So we designed these bandanas, which will be cool to give our cat uh, donors and our dog donors to say, hey, these pets are heroes. They donate blood to save other animals uh, in the hospital. So after they donate, they'll get these bandanas to recognize their contribution to help other pets. 
And so what are the goals of having a blood bank? Like I said, we have our own employee donors, but we would also like to have client owned donors to meet all the needs of the hospital so that we would not have to reach for these uh, blood banks. So we'd like to be able to cover the needs of Angel Boston and our sister clin uh, clinic in, at Angel West. So even with that being said, if we were successful in getting this large blood bank together, we could be a regional supplier to the surrounding tertiary hospitals because those hospitals will still be having trouble obtaining blood. And so we'd like to work together if they need blood to save a patient, we want to be able to offer that to um, the other big facilities so that they can still save pets and not, not be strapped if they don't have blood or blood products. Ms. Chewy, I just, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them at this time. Dr. Willen, that's so interesting. Thank you for the overview. Let's jump right into the questions. And if you have more questions, gang, you can put them right into the QA box and we'll get to them. So um, you touched on this a little bit, but I'm so curious. We're all very familiar with the typical narrative when it comes to human blood donations, right? Usually something happens, a disaster, and there may be people injured, and we all sort of line up to give blood. That doesn't really happen in the animal world, right? There aren't many mass events that people think, oh, so many animals are affected in a way where they may need blood. I'm going to rush to a hospital such as Angel and donate blood. And the former example still leaves many human hospitals with uh, very tight blood and blood product supplies. So the question is, um, how do we feel about the inventory we'll have in three or four months? And I guess the follow-up question is, what do we need to do to ensure people have much more awareness about the need for blood in veterinary hospitals so that uh, people can uh, bring in pets and have pets be donors. Yeah, I think we just have to educate people. Most people don't even know that animals get blood transfusions. Sometimes they're shocked by that. And they say, well, where do you get the blood and how does that transpire? We know very clearly in human medicine how it's used, but in veterinary practice, it's not um, well understood by clients. My husband had no idea that animals uh, can donate blood and um, be a donor. So he said, let's get our dog. Chewy's a little bit on the uh, small end. You definitely need a certain, you know, size. You'd like to have about a 20 kilogram, about 40 pound dog so that uh, their blood donation doesn't cause an issue for them. So there are some size limitations. But I think with the pandemic and people obtaining a lot of pets and people seeking higher level care that they really do want to find out and treat to the highest degree that often we're reaching for more and more transfusions. So if we had this on site, we would never have a problem um, taking a pet to surgery emergently, not having to wait or try to ask, um, you know, a sister hospital like, hey, do you have any blood? Because just in case we need it, we would have our own supply and be very secure. That's very helpful. Are there thorny issues around ethics associated with this that the veterinary community is talking about or grapples with? Like for us, as human donors, we're in control of that. We make a decision to go and donate. Obviously for a dog or a cat, the decision is made for them. Um, any color you can provide us on that? Yeah, I don't know too much about how the national blood banks obtain their blood. Do they have a colony of pets that they bleed or how that transpires? At Angel, when we ran a program that was uh, larger about 20 years ago, um, we obviously through, go through a lot of education and the clients that understand uh, really want to be part of this program because it's awesome. They want to support other animals like how great would you feel if your dog saved another dog's life and so yeah. i have found in the past when we had a bigger program that uh people were anxious and eager to be part of it and loved it good that's helpful and encouraging uh, so on that that subject of the donors themselves the dogs and cats are they fully conscious are they sedated when they are bled when they're donating blood how do they recover afterwards 
They recover totally fine. Usually they need mild sedation, cats more than dogs, obviously. Um, but we sedate pets all the time for bloods, x-rays. It's very common practice because it's a nice way to do fear-free so that they don't feel any type of stress. Often them are used to coming into the hospital. They get treats. It's kind of like an excitement. Uh, so the sedation lasts, um, you know, just a little bit and we have reversal agents. So they really just give their blood, pop right up, get their treats uh, and they're on their way. So uh, we have control over that. So the ethics of it, we can do it in a way that's humane and fear free uh, so that that's not a problem. And the treats make a big difference. I oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They just like to get the attention. The blood donors always get the most attention in the hospital because they're yep. coming in to do a great service for the rest of the pets in the hospital. They are four-legged heroes. Yes. Is there a universal blood type for cats as there is for dogs? Not a universal. Uh, cats are either A, B, or AB. B is the rarest of the blood type and it's hard to get. So sometimes we like to keep one on site. So we will order, you know, six months in advance and have a unit in case we have a B um, cat. We had a B donor in the past, so we would rarely use them, but when we needed it, it was very, very helpful. So that's sometimes where we resource with other tertiary facilities. If we happen to have a B cat, we need to give them uh, typed appropriate blood or B blood. So that's where we often call, does anybody have B blood in the state? It can be, it can be difficult. So for those poor cats who just happen to have a rare blood type, it can be tricky. Yeah. All the more reason to try and recruit more cats yeah. into the program, right? Yeah, we type them to figure out what they are so that we would know and we would be able to call on the cat if we needed bee blood. Are there other animals in the hospital that ever need blood, like birds or ferrets? And will we be I, yeah, accepting we have done, those species? Yeah, we have done rabbit and uh, ferret transfusions. Typically you would need, again, the, the same species. So uh, sometimes ferrets have a buddy. And so there are other ferret mate in the house will donate to save uh, the other ferret in the house is common. Technically you, we have given cat blood to a rabbit uh, when we, we don't have rabbit donors. Um, and so uh, it usually we have a donation. It's that there's two rabbits in a household and um, one owner is willing to have the other rabbit donate to help their friend. Okay, another question. I'm looking at a question and I hope I understand the question. I'm just gonna read it as is. Um, if a client, so if a, if a dog owner has multiple dogs, can they agree to donate for one pet from another? Yes. Okay. Sure. If I you, don't know if I understood. You the mean question. like I think they're saying that they have multiple dogs in the household and say a pet needed it, could they use their other dog to donate? Oh, the answer, the answer yeah. is yes. It's the same as like a rabbit or a ferret friend. They would just have to meet the requirements. You know, typically we don't like to have dogs donate that are you know over a certain age or under a certain weight. Uh, you know, make sure that they're healthy and that they're appropriate donors. But of course, absolutely. Okay. These are great questions, guys. A uh, couple more. Um, how much time between donations is required? Is it a week? Is it a month? How often can a healthy pet donate? Yeah, we like to do it at least two months for a dog, at least three months for a cat. So if we had a donor program, we would have, say, maybe a dog donate a couple times a year. We would not like them to donate more frequently because that would not be considered humane or ethical like that would be uh, not appropriate so we would, we're very strict on making sure that it's good for the donor as well. Oh that's so good and then one final question then we'll bring uh, Neil back into the conversation, so if i'm an angel employee or i'm yes. a client, uh, what do I do right now, if I want to start get my pet signed up. So angel employee, you would just email one of us, we would be able to screen, do a physical, be able to get that executed right away. For the clients, we're waiting for donations so that we can build the right laboratory facility so we can actually house and do the capabilities of a large scale client owned blood donation. And so it's, it's, we're on the precipice of being able to do that next step so we would gladly take your name if you're an angel client so that when we're ready we can reach out to you do your physical exam give you everything to make sure your pet is healthy to donate and we would love to have you so for current clients who are on the line now reach out to your veterinarian yeah. angel and express interest and i expect at some point we'll have a section on our website called donors wanted <laughs> for people yes. to 
go through the process. Dr. Whelan, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for your great questions. Neil, we'll turn it back over to you. Oh, thank you, Rob. And Dr. Whelan, I just, I love this. I, it's, blood is in my soul uh, <laughs> after all the years that I spent at the American Red Cross. So um, you know you have my support and thank you again for an interesting and enjoyable presentation. It was really a privilege to have you share your insights with us. And I just have to say how proud I am of the staff uh, and you um, for being leading edge on so many things. This is really a great example of how Angel takes the first step and the biggest step in new areas. And um, I just think it's terrific. Friends, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learn more about our good work and about yet another component of the mission of our organization. If we indeed moved you to make a donation, um, whether it was money or blood, thank you so very much. If you're still thinking about making a financial donation, again, please go to MSPCAgivingday.org. That's MSPCAgivingday.org. I want to thank all of today's presenters for helping us feel immersed in the heroic, life-saving work the MSPCA Angel performs every day on behalf of animals. And from the bottom of our hearts, I offer thanks to all of you for your dedication to animals and, your, and for your commitment to our cause. We cannot do this work without you. I will say it again. We cannot do this work without you and your support. Thank you again from all of us and have a great evening. Thank you.